Hello and welcome to Shredder Zoo. Today we're taking a look at some of the inhabitants of the invertebrate house here at the zoo. Let's start our tour by looking at the Titanomerma, a genus of giant ant whose fossils have been found in Europe in areas that were tropical during the early part of the Eocene, an epoch that lasted from 56 million to 34 million years ago, a time when the continents were closer together and the sea level was low. This is significant as one species of this ant has been found in Wyoming. These giant bugs may have crossed an Arctic land bridge between Europe and North America during a particularly warm period in Earth's history. The dossier here in Ark describes them as being big as a dog, but in reality they were as big as a hummingbird. That's about 2 inches long with a wingspan of almost 6 inches. Still huge for an ant. The only fossils so far found have been of queen ants, no workers are yet known. One living ant species, the driver ant, has queens that reach the size of this ancient ant, although Titanomerma was big all over, while the driver ant gets its size from an abnormally swollen abdomen. The well preserved fossils indicate that Titanomerma had no sting and probably sprayed formic acid as a defence. It either ate fresh food, as in the manner of leafcutter ants, which eat only the fungi they personally cultivate in their nests, or it was carnivorous. The presence of Titanomerma in North America is considered to indicate the first reported cross-Arctic dispersal by a thermophilic insect group. Moving on to the leech. The dossier here in Ark claims the leech belongs to the genus Hemantria. These leeches can be found today in the waterways of the Amazon, known as the Amazon Giant Leech. It's quite possibly the world's largest blood-sucking leech. It is a jawless freshwater leech that can grow to 450mm, that's about 17.7 .7 inches in length, and 100mm, that's about 3.9 inches in width. Unlike the jawed leeches that bite using two or three rows of jaws, depending on the species, so it's in either a V for the two-jawed leeches or an upside-down Y fashion for the three-jawed leeches, this particular leech has a hypodermic needle lying in wait inside its mouth. When prey comes within range, they extend their proboscis like a spear. Once the leech is attached to the prey, the proboscis then functions much like a straw that releases anticoagulants and starts to suck up the blood. A specimen of the Amazon giant leech had not been collected since 1893 and it was thought to be extinct. Grandma Moses was one of two adults that was rediscovered in the 1970s in a pond by Dr. Roy Sawyer. Grandma Moses founded a leech breeding colony at the University of California Berkeley and produced more than 750 offspring valued at $150 each in three years. Following its death, Grandma Moses was deposited in the collections of the Department of the Invertebrate Zoology, the National Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Institution. Moving on now to the Akatina, or the giant snail. The name Akatina is actually a name given to a genus of very large air-breathing snails, the largest of which is the giant African land snail, native to West Africa. The shells of these snails often grow to a length of 18 centimeters, that's about 7.1 inches, with a diameter of 9 centimeters, that's 3.5 inches. Certain examples have been surveyed in the wild at about 30 by 15 centimeters, making them the largest extant land snail species known. During my research, I could find very little about the prehistoric history of these type of snails, but if you want to know about the biggest snails known, then you need to look under the sea. Campanile gigantum is a species of exceptionally large fossil sea snail, with a shell length of 40 to 60 centimetres. This is considered to be one of the largest lengthwise species of shelled gastropod that ever lived, and is found mostly in the Paris basin. Next on our tour is the dung beetle. Now I've already done a video on these creatures, and I'll leave a link to it in the description of this video. The same for our next two inhabitants, the Pulmonus scorpius and the Arrhenio. If you want to know more, check the links in the description. So now on to the mantis. The earliest mantis fossils are about 135 million years old from Siberia. Fossils of the group are rare. By 2007, only about 25 fossil species were known. Fossil mantises, including one from Japan with spines on the front legs as in modern mantises, have been found in Cretaceous amber. Most fossils in amber are nymphs. Compression fossils, which are the ones found in rock, include adults as well. 
Much like the dung beetle, spiders and scorpions here in Ark, the mantis is hugely enlarged to fantasy proportions. The largest living mantis is the giant Asian mantis, which can be had as a common pet. Adult females are about 3.5 inches long, that's about 8 to 9 centimeters, and the males are a bit smaller at about 3 inches, that's about 7 to 8 centimeters. The males are also much thinner and lighter than the females. Now, from a creature that is hugely exaggerated in size to one that is not, this is the Arthropleura. It is from a genus of extinct millipede arthropods that lived in what is now northeastern North America and Scotland around 315 to 299 million years ago during the late Carboniferous period. The largest species of the genus are the largest known land invertebrates of all time. The larger species, which the one here in Ark is obviously based on, could grow to about 2.3 metres, that's about 7.5 foot long, and had a width of up to 50 centimetres. But how did it grow so big? The laws of nature impose tight limits on the maximum size that arthropods can attain. The arthropod body is completely encased in an exoskeleton. The legs are made up of jointed tubes that contain the muscles necessary for the movement. As the animal's size increases, the walls of these leg tubes rapidly increase in thickness and operating the limbs soon would be impossible if the animal grew too big. Another constraint faced by large arthropods is breathing. Small forms such as insects can breathe through tubes that open onto the outside of the body. The body then absorbs the oxygen into the blood through specialised soft membranes. The surface area of a body increases in proportion to the square of its dimensions, but the body's volume increases as the cube. Now this means that if the size of an animal doubles, its body volume, which needs to be supplied by the oxygen, increases eightfold. This geometrical relationship significantly constrains size increase. But the huge size of Arthropleura and other giant invertebrates has been attributed to the greater abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere of this time. Higher oxygen levels in the past meant that the gas could be carried further into the body and also diffused deeper into tissues. A given unit volume of air would also be able to feed a larger quantity of tissue. Another benefit of increased oxygen diffusion into tissues was that the invertebrate's internal composition could be sufficiently dense to be able to support itself. If Arthropleura existed today, its trachees would have to form a much more extensive network, causing the creature to be less dense and therefore liable to be crushed by its own weight. Here in Ark, the Arthropleura is portrayed as an aggressive carnivore, but in reality it was likely a herbivore feeding off decaying leaf litter that would have been abundant in the Carboniferous period. Fossilised stomach contents and excrement showed that it had been feeding on plant material. Now another giant of its time is the Meganeura. Its size too has been put down to the higher oxygen content of the Carboniferous period. First discovered in France in 1880, Meganeura is one of the largest known flying insects to ever exist, with a wingspan of up to 75 centimetres, that's two and a half foot. Although superficially similar to a dragonfly, Meganeura and others like it are generally referred to as griffonflies, due to morphological differences between them and the dragonflies. Meganeura is likely to have hunted and fed in much the same way as dragonflies do today, although from its larger size it may suggest that many more creatures could have been on the menu for it. Aside from other invertebrates, potential prey may also include small amphibians. So we come to the last occupant of the invertebrate house, the Lymantria. Much like the snail, dung beetle, spider and mantis, the Lymantria is not based on any one particular moth species, but the genus of tussock moth, just around 2,500 species worldwide. Unlike those other creatures, it has been increased in size to fantasy proportions. My research turned up very little information about prehistoric Lamantria, but there is some limited information about moths and butterflies in general. The earliest known fossil, Lepidopterium, is from the Jurassic, about 190 million years ago, found in Dorset in the UK. The fossil belongs to a small, primitive moth-like species. But in general, fossils of moths and butterflies are rare. But if you want to know about the biggest moths of today, then you may be interested in the white witch moth, who has the largest wingspan of any insect alive today, being up to 30 centimetres, that's 12 inches. Or maybe the Hercules moth, found in Australia. Its wings have the largest documented surface area, that's 300 square centimetres, of any living insect. 
Well, we have come to the end of our tour of the Invertebrate House here at Shredder Zoo. I really hope you've enjoyed the video and you've learned something new. Don't forget to check out the videos earlier in the series that cover the dung beetle, scorpion and the spiders. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video and feel free to comment down below. I really hope to see you next time for more here at Shredder Zoo. Goodbye.